I am Nikki Bauman, and I want to welcome you all to this evening's presentation, Transforming Molecular Testing Through Automation, New Insights and Possibilities. Uh, I work at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where I co-direct the Central Clinical Lab. I also direct the Central Processing Area, and I'm the director of the Clinical Chemistry Fellowship Program there. My role today, I, I'm actually a true clinical chemist, um, not a molecular pathologist, so my role today is to moderate this session, um, having over 10 years of experience of, with automation in the core laboratory. Before I begin, I have just a few announcements. First, I'd like to thank Roche Diagnostics for supporting this event tonight. Roche has actually supported many AACC events, and we very much appreciate their support. So thank you to Roche, and I'd like to give just a round of applause to our Roche sponsors. <laughs> you will have opportunity to ask questions after the speakers finish their presentations. There'll be a panel discussion up at this table, so we ask you to hold your questions until the end, and we do have time allotted for that. And finally, there are continuing education credits available for this event. You will be receiving an email with instructions on how to obtain those continuing education credits. So I'll begin now. I'm going to just take a few minutes to give uh, an overview of automation from my perspective, again, as a clinical chemist and a director of a core laboratory. So as I mentioned, um, we have a core laboratory at Mayo Clinic, uh, termed the Central Clinical Lab. In that laboratory, we receive about 10,000 patient specimens per day. Our uh, 85 to 90% of our work is actually specimens coming from our, our outpatient clinics and our two hospitals, St. Mary's Hospital and Methodist Hospital. Um, out of those 10,000 specimens that arrive in the central processing area, roughly 8,000 of those stay within the four walls of the central clinical lab and are loaded on one of two automation lines. We have a hematology automation line and also a chemistry immunoassay automation line. So when we start thinking about automation, I think uh, the sales pitch is always that automation will actually improve quality in laboratory medicine. And I would say it does approve, uh, improve efficiency. It has improved quality in our laboratory, but there are a lot of considerations that you have to take into account when automating any process. And many of you have probably heard the phrase, don't automate a bad process, and it is extremely true. There are benefits of automating laboratory workflow, and many of these are obvious, but you have to think about those benefits because they also come with some challenges. Automation brings standardization to a process, so it takes away the variability. It reduces human error, it reduces batching, and the workflow bottlenecks that can occur because of batching. In a chemistry, hematology, immunoassay laboratory, automation also helps to do load balancing across analyzers. And any of those of you in the room that have core lab experience know that if you have two analyzers sitting in the lab, invariably the techs will, for some reason, favor one of those analyzers over the other. Whether they unfairly call the other one a lemon, whether there's fewer steps to get to this analyzer than there is the other one, automation takes care of that. So you have that load balancing efficiency in your workflow. And I think one of the really important aspects, in addition to standardization, is that automation allows technical people to do technical work. But the automation has to be done right. The advancements that we've seen in automating the pre-analytical phase are really widespread and common. There aren't very many labs, that, uh, at least large labs, that you'll walk into today that don't have automation to some extent in the core laboratory. And what I've shown here are some of the steps that may have been manual in earlier days, such as sorting, centrifugation, and aliquoting. And those can all be accomplished now 
by a line that looks something like the modular preanalytic system on the right side, where all of these steps can be accomplished by automation. So you reduce a lot of the hands-on time that, were, that was done to accomplish tasks that really aren't technical, but rather mundane. We also have to think about some of the not so obvious challenges that occur when you automate laboratory processes. While automation accomplishes standardization, it also requires you to think about standardization of all of the inputs into your laboratory. So in this case, I'm calling it the pre-pre-analytic phase because you want to think about have you standardized blood collection tubes? Have you thought about what kind of stopper is on those tubes and can the automation handle uncapping that tube, recapping that tube? Have you talked to your phlebotomy staff to say that, look, we really need a full tube collected because otherwise the automation is going to cause an error and say that it's either quantity not sufficient or a short draw? Unless you've worked with your staff, batching may still occur. Why is that? Because you're going to have human touch at some point in the process, whether it's collecting the samples coming in from the pneumatic tube, unless you teach the staff about continuous workflow, it's easier for them to batch and load those batches onto the automation, and then you really haven't accomplished any efficiency at all. Workflow bottlenecks still exist mostly because the automation will do things the way the automation does it, and the humans want to do things the way they've always done them. So you have to figure out that compromise, that meet in the middle of how can we accomplish what we want to accomplish using the functionality of the automation. And manual workarounds pop up. So because of this, you still may find that your technical people are doing non-analytical work. And I always say to people that ask about automation, go into the lab and ask your techs what they're spending their time doing. Because you'll find out little workarounds that have crept in. If on day one of your automation implementation, you may have had a very streamlined workflow in place, the things that irritate the techs they will devise workarounds, and you'll find that they're doing things that are bypassing the automation. And because of that, automation is a journey, not a destination. So I like this phrase, continuous improvement causes us to think about upstream process, not downstream damage control. And we in the laboratory are very good at putting out fires. We're very good at damage control. I think to make automation work and to really reap all of the benefits, and there are many, to reap those benefits, we need to always think about the upstream process and to think about continuous improvement. And continuous improvement is just that, it's continuous. I have been directing clinical chemistry laboratories with total lab automation for over a decade and we are always doing process improvement every single day, every single week. So in an automated setting, you have to work to get the quality sample you need. As I've mentioned, beware of those workarounds because they will pop up all the time even when you think your system is optimized. When things go wrong, we need to identify the root cause because most of the time they can be fixed but we have to know the root cause and not an assumption. As I've mentioned several times, never stop optimizing. And I think it's important in your lab to make doing the right thing easy and doing the wrong thing hard, because then you end up with buy-in. The benefits of automation are real and they're significant. At the bottom of this slide, I have some photographs of the Central Clinical Lab in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic. And some of our benefits have been that technologists spend more time doing technologist level work. And if you look at these pictures, what you'll notice, uh, and maybe it's not completely evident, but I'll, maybe I, I'll draw your attention so here we have three technologists working, 
And really, all three of this te these technologists are handling data. If you look in the background at the analyzers in the lab, you don't see technologists standing at those analyzers. And I think that's the big trend and the shift that I've seen with automation in the core lab is that 10 years ago, you would basically have one technologist for every analyzer. And now you have total lab automation where the techs are handling the difficult samples, the samples that have problems, the results that can't be auto-verified. They're using their heads for what they were trained to do. And you see these instruments plugging along and doing the work. We've seen increased volume in our lab while maintaining staff satisfaction. And actually, in our central processing area, we've, as we do up, um, continuous process improvement, we've taken surveys of the lab staff asking about their impression or perception of volumes as we do tests of change in the lab. And we've had a few that are quite interesting because as we make lean improvements, we find that the perception of the staff is that volume has stayed the same when really it has increased. And we're gonna hear quite a bit today about laboratory design um, and workflow efficiency. So I think that uh, lean strategies are very important when you think about automation. And I mentioned that continuous improvement is just that, it's continuous. Uh, this is not my show today, but I did wanna share two things that have occurred just in about the last year and a half in our laboratory. And as I said, we've had automation at Mayo Clinic since 2009, and yet we're still doing process improvements. In the central processing area, uh, the staff actually lead all of the lean initiatives. We have lean teams. Those are all staff driven. And in the processing area, there still is manual work that occurs uh, from when the samples are received in the lab to when they're loaded on the automation. There's some manual sorting that occurs. It's a short amount of time, but that lean team, based on their brainstorming and their continuous improvement, reduced that time from 14.2 minutes with a standard deviation of 2.3 minutes to 8.3 minutes with a standard deviation of 1.7. When you're dealing with just a 14 minute process, reducing it by six minutes is actually quite significant. And also within the last year, oh, sorry, the formatting got a little messed up on this. Uh, we use middleware rules and serum indices in our lab. By optimizing how we use those rules on the automation, We've actually reduced recollection rates of samples for AST and direct bilirubin by 82% and 62% respectively. So as I've mentioned, even though automation isn't new to us, we keep tweaking things, we keep making improvements. So what are the next advancements that we expect to see in automation? I, I hope that in our laboratory will be expanding beyond just automated chemistry, immunoassay, and hematology. Um, the functionality is there. There are some challenges, but that's really the next advancement. I hope to see more flexibility for automation systems to accommodate different analyzers and different specimens. A lot of time is spent in laboratories trying to, as I said, standardize those inputs and if we can get more flexibility in our systems, I think it will really help laboratories. And the topic for today is consolidation of lab areas that are traditionally operating in silos. So this means pulling um, disciplines like molecular diagnostics or microbiology into the core lab automated venue. So without further ado, I will introduce our two speakers tonight. Our second speaker tonight, who will be talking about molecular testing's role in post-operative transplant monitoring, is Dr. Philip Ruiz. Dr. Ruiz is at the University of Miami in Florida, where he's professor of pathology and surgery and medical director of transplant laboratories. He obtained his PhD in immunology from the University of Florida and an MD from George Washington University. He did his pathology residency and fellowship at Duke University. 
and he's an internationally recognized expert in transplantation pathology, immunology, and immunopathology. Our first speaker tonight will be Dr. John Longshore, and he'll be speaking to us about automating high volume molecular testing in the core lab. Dr. Longshore is at the Carolinas Pathology Group in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's director of molecular pathology there and leads the laboratory for the Carolinas healthcare system. He obtained his PhD from the University of Alabama and did a clinical molecular genetics fellowship at Greenwood Genetic Center. His research interests lie in companion diagnostics and the utilization of molecular markers in personalized medicine. So it's my pleasure to welcome the two speakers this evening. Good evening. Uh, it's always nice to get to uh, present to a group of individuals who have an open bar at the back of the room. So you guys are having much more fun than uh, I am behind the podium. But thank you to the uh, AACC for the invitation to present this evening and to Roche for sponsoring this event. Tonight I'm going to tell you a brief story of my journey in Charlotte, North Carolina over the last 15 years of my, pro <clears throat> my professional life and how my laboratory has evolved over time since moving there 15 years ago from the Greenwood Genetic Center. My story really is not going to be unique, but something I think that many in the audience can, can identify with. And it's coming completely from the perspective of a laboratory director <clears throat> rather than a lean prick practitioner and efficiency expert or something like that. So continuing education is available for the event this evening. So these are my learning objectives. Um, I hope all of you take the opportunity to learn something from the presentations that you will hear and to be able to take some of these materials uh, back home to your own laboratories and uh, share these with your other laboratory staff and technologists. My primary professional responsibility is directing the molecular pathology lab for the Carolinas Pathology Group and the Carolinas Healthcare System in Charlotte, North Carolina. CHS is a 43 hospital integrated health network, largely across North and South Carolina. We have about 10 million patient visits per year, 62,000 employees at over 900 care locations. And we have large academic type hospitals all the way down to 50 and 70 bed community type hospitals in our system. So we have quite a diverse um, type of physician needs that we have to meet from a molecular testing perspective. As far as my laboratory, we are a full service technique focused molecular lab. We've been in existence for about 15 years. Um, we serve as the central molecular pathology lab for the Carolinas healthcare system. We process in the neighborhood of 350 to 400,000 molecular samples a year. Uh, we have a robust clinical trial program where we serve industry for both PMA and 510K approvals. So we've been responsible for several biomarker uh, approvals or, the lab, or perform some of the laboratory testing for them. We often perform a lot of workflow studies or analysis uh, of method comparisons in, in my lab. So we, we generate a lot of data with that. And we're large enough that we're able to have a continuous flow type of operation uh, in, my, in my laboratory. So this is my oldest slide. It's about 22 years old. I keep updating a little bit. So with all apologies to Maslow, here are my uh, hierarchy of happiness or self-actualization in the molecular pathology lab. Because I think we all know we have to start with administrative support, have personnel, space, and equipment. So the great trifecta to me are people, space and equipment to make sure you can do laboratory testing appropriately. And if you look at the types of pressures that we are all facing in our laboratories today and the types of opportunities that we have in our laboratories today, I think this is not unique to my situation, but something that we all can identify with. Uh, medicine is really a business now, although we still, as laboratorians, first and foremost care for the patient but we're constantly facing cost pressures and being asked to do more for less and being able to do testing less efficiently, uh, more efficiently or more cost effectively than we can purchase it from a uh, reference laboratory for those of us in hospital-based systems. So let's start at the beginning. 15 years ago in 2001, I moved from the Greenwood Genetic Center where my laboratory was one of the largest molecular labs in the United States to a new opportunity where the laboratory was one-tenth the size uh, the Carolina's healthcare system in Charlotte. When I arrived there 15 years ago, 
Um, I had two techs. I had 400 square feet of laboratory space that really wasn't laboratory space. If you notice, this was actually a library stock room that I inherited for my original laboratory. We put you know, some flammable cabinets in, uh, not a BSL hood, but just a good old chemical fume hood. We had one sink uh, and uh, all the safety equipment, which actually took up more of the space than the testing space. So we had a tremendous send out volume at that time from the CHS facilities and some very poorly equipped laboratory space. The next year, laboratory administration was very generous to us and they gave us an additional thousand square feet that was allocated for molecular testing and this was in some um, laboratory space that belonged to the microbiology lab. The problem is I had two laboratory spaces that were a 10 minute walk apart from each other in completely different buildings in the hospital. So we were up to a few thousand laboratory tests from a molecular perspective at that point. Two years later, I moved to a hospital that was one mile away, moved into an old blood bank space at a hospital called Carolina's Medical Center Mercy, one mile away from the main hospital. So you see the story, I'm getting further and further away from, from the central lab. And this would be my lab's home for 10 years. We moved there because we were moving from three non-contiguous spaces down into one room of well-equipped lab space to do molecular testing. And this was our home for 10 years, and this time we grew from about 3,000 molecular tests a year to about 300,000 samples a year in 2012. So if you look at where my laboratory was uh, three years ago, we had gone from that one nice contiguous space that we had in 2003 to seven non-contiguous spaces. I had the blood bank room we originally moved into, uh, a storage room, a conference room that we had taken over to put automated instruments in, a surgical grossing area that I had repurposed for molecular testing, a secretarial office with one of our high volume molecular instruments in it, a histology lab that we had reconverted into molecular space, and even better, something I'm sure all of you have to struggle with, some of my instruments were located in the morgue because that's where space was available. So we were doing molecular testing in the morgue space. So. We are equal opportunity offenders and we would take any and all space that we could find that would be available to us. So this was a snapshot of where all of our laboratories were three years ago when we began the journey to form a new, a new core lab. We had 12 acute care hospitals that fed into our lab along with six freestanding emergency departments, uh, 19 patient service centers across uh, Charlotte, uh, about 3,000 providers and 938 medical practices and all the traditional medical uh, laboratory departments that you would expect to see. We're quite a large uh, transplant center for both hematologic malignancies, bone marrow transplants, solid tumor oncology. Uh, we have a large cytogenetics operation, molecular operations, so really all these types of sophisticated molecular capabilities and laboratory capabilities that you would expect for an integrated health network. The problem is, all of these facilities were located in three hospitals that were geographically distributed and very distant from each other across the Charlotte, North Carolina area. So we looked at several options three years ago to decide what would make more sense to us, to move all of our testing back into Carolina's medical center, uh, to transition the CMC facility, our main 1200 bed hospital into an acute care lab and develop a new facility to consolidate specialized testing and outreach testing. We looked at just selling it all to a reference lab, sending it out and we looked at keeping our specialized testing and sending everything else, or the, uh, the, the good old American way of doing nothing. And uh, so what we decided to do is to establish a core laboratory facility that is four miles away from our main laboratory facility. Uh, so we have an extensive courier network, and the business case that we made for this was due to the growth of our acute care lab at Carolina's Medical Center and converting it into an acute care lab rather than a core laboratory the rapid growth that we had seen in the system, uh, that we had really outgrown our facilities, which were very geographically uh, isolated, and that we had core lab functions at five different test locations or hospital locations across Charlotte. So the bottom line was we were really having a big problem with the impact of our laboratory testing and delays on patient care. So one of the first things we did when we decided to have a core lab was to have an affinity diagram exercise. Have any of you ever done one of these? They're lots of fun. It's, it is, who is your best friend? So all the laboratory departments sit around and we talk about what synergies we have for samples, supplies, 
and technologists between all of our areas. So who are your best friends? The problem as a molecular laboratory director is that we were at the center of the affinity diagram because every other department in the hospital laboratory said that they had more synergy with molecular diagnostics than anything else. And that's because we were a small technique focused lab and everybody sent things to us. And this could, ra could range from histology, from cytology, from cytogenetics, from HLA, from microbiology, from virology, from the blood bank. Everybody's best partner was molecular. So we decided we needed to be uh, at the middle of the facility when it was designed. We used a 3P process for design and actually changed up 3P a little bit. Usually instead of people being one of the P's, you hear about production being one of the P's when it is traditionally used in a manufacturing type of environment. But to us, 3P was about people, process, preparation. All team members had an equal vote and everybody participated in the 3P design process. And it's been one, it was one of the most frustrating times for me as a lab director because I have designed several labs through the year to actually let go of the process and for me not to dictate what happened in the lab, how it was designed, but actually let the bench level technologist drive the design. My job was to be there and to put up guardrails on the edge of the road and to keep them from running off the road with the laboratory design. And it was not just laboratorians who participated in this process, but we had nursing staff, we had security staff, we had maintenance, pharmacy, engineering, information technology, nothing was off limits in this process for consideration. <clears throat> All of the 3P events for every area of the lab were held in a one week period. And the uh, plan, do, study, act process was, was really used. For instance, in our molecular 3P event, there were 21 participants with a combined 159 years of molecular laboratory experience. <clears throat> During our design process for the week for the molecular area, we used 200 sheets, 200 four by eight plywood size sheets of cardboard, 50 rolls of Gorilla Tape, we built 250 items, we drank six cases of soda, used 250 sheets of flip chart paper, and cumulatively between the 21 participants, I don't believe this, but this is the data they gave me, there were only 80 hours of sleep that the whole group reported. So it was a very, very busy week, as you can imagine, with a very tired, and dedicated group. <clears throat> we consolidated many concepts down to one. So we, the 21 participants were divided into groups of three for brainstorming. We looked at nine to 12 potential layouts for each area of the laboratory, narrowed it down to three, and then we used objective quantifiable uh, criteria to vote on them to pick one. Then what we would do is we would build a full scale model out of cardboard. And I'll show you some pictures of this in a minute if you've never seen this. We, then we would simulate the lab processes for optimization, and if we didn't like it, we would go back to the design process, rebuild it out of cardboard, and change what was different, and to try to do it again. Because it's very easy to look at things on paper, but until you build it and live it full scale, you really don't know what life is going to be like. So visually, you can see the process at work here. Uh, you brainstorm and decide on a concept. You build your laboratory benches, all of the equipment from nitrogen tanks to pipettes to centrifuges to everything, staplers, I mean everything down to the most minute detail. You, you simulate in the lab, you go back, you redesign, <clears throat> and you try it and start again until you find the best process. <clears throat> the participants in 3P events for our laboratory design were constantly challenged. So we not only had laboratorians who were helping design the process, but all the other specialties I told you about. When you have someone from environmental services asking you why you do things that way and an outside set of eyes that doesn't understand the status quo or why you do things a certain way, it's very liberating. And we found lots of different ways to do the type of laboratory testing and to optimize our processes. Because this is how we've always done it was not an acceptable reason for why something was done a particular way. I was only allowed to visit the group at the end of the day to make sure they were staying inside the regulatory boundaries and really couldn't say I like this or I like that because we wanted it to be a technologist driven design process and there was a constant push for excellence all through this process. Now at the end I was one of the participants in our master 3P product, project. So we had all of the 3P events for the different areas of the laboratory then my job at the end with a with group of uh, 21 of us again 
was to play a jigsaw puzzle. We had a building that was 28,800 square feet. It was rectangular shaped. Those were our boundaries. How do we make those optimized areas all fit under the same roof without changing the workflow in each of the areas that were designed? The only givens we had were the boundaries of the building and that the support columns could not be moved. And we had multiple concepts we voted on and came down to a single design. Other things we had to worry about is the automation line. Where do you put an automation line? It made more sense to put it in the middle of the facility, but we wanted it to be an open design with lots of flexibility. So we really tried to, for the design to gravitate to anchoring the, the automation line toward one of the ends of the building. And it was an open concept with the exception of our TB mycology rooms, our virology rooms, and our uh, molecular preamp room, which are actually set aside with glass walls. So you can have a good visual impact to see all the way through the facility from one end to the other. So this was our cut and paste diagram of the one concept that we came up with. There were very few changes from this design we came up with at the end of the, of the uh, Master 3P event to the actual lab. So this is actually a full scale cut and paste diagram that we, that we came up with. So as I told you, we, we built all of the individual 3P events, fully mocked the lab areas out of cardboard. You have no idea what type of chaos you can create until you have a 28,800 square foot laboratory completely constructed out of cardboard. But that's what we did at the end of the 3P. So we wanted everybody to be able to walk through and to see how samples would flow, how work would flow between departments and things like that. Um, so there was lots of work, a big design process, and it really had a big payoff. So the evolution of our design was to start with brainstorming, to present the concept, to simulate, build it out of cardboard, simulate it again, draft a plan, do 3D modeling, and then to build the lab. One thing that we really liked when we put all the areas together for our, our uh, Master 3P event is how things worked out. We actually ended up with our high volume area being to the left of the building and our lowest volume area being to the right of the building. So we have a, a workflow from high volume all the way to the lowest volume. So our chemistry, hematology, microbiology, molecular, HLA, and then cytogenetics on the far end of the building. <coughs> with our materials management on the backside and specimen management and send out processing on the backside. So I think the design really worked out well. And one of the nice things that, that really was a benefit to us when we put this design together was the way it worked out. We had a specimen management and materials management zone that was at the back of the building. We had a clinical zone where all the testing occurred in the middle. And then all of our support staff, our offices and everything else, break room were on the front side of the building. So it really worked out quite well. And my favorite part is my office ended up right by the emergency exit. So when people come to visit and they come in to visit her, I have about two minutes that I can escape the facility before I have to talk to them. So, <clears throat> so this is what the 3D design uh, wor worked out to look like uh, with our automation line being on this end of the building and our lowest volume in HLA and cytogenetics on the, on the backside. And what I'm gonna talk about in just a minute is our materials management, because I think that has been one of the biggest wins for us uh, in this facility. But to wrap up all of our 3P events, we had nine events, 176 days, 39 different clinical departments from the hospital participated. Now, we were designing a lab, but there were only 103 people from the lab, and we had 138 from areas outside the lab that participated in the laboratory design. So something different from how we might see things traditionally done. Together we had almost 2,000 years of healthcare experience and we put about over 5,500 hours of design time into this. <coughs> so, excuse me, as I said when we started, <coughs> This was an existing laboratory office park. <coughs> Sorry about that. So <clears throat> this was designed as a warehouse storage facility. It was not designed to be a laboratory. This is in an office park that is adjacent, excuse me, <clears throat> adjacent to the Charlotte Airport where we have about 3,000 hospital employees in the, in the facility altogether. So, 
We had about 30 feet of ceiling to work with if we wanted to and support columns, but aside from that, we tore the slab up inside the building. We wanted to start from scratch, make sure everything was done correctly. There was a laboratory in this facility about 10 years ago that had not uh, functioned well with some of their liquid handling. One of the problems when we tore the slab up is we, we discovered that the entire building, the outflow for plumbing was a four inch pipe. So that's why they were having flooding in the building. So we wanted to tear everything up from the ground up and uh, make sure that uh, we designed it right. So we moved into the facility about 15 months ago. The move process went very well, although I'm sure all of you share my sentiment that I'd rather move my house 10 times than move a lab. You don't have to validate and verify a microwave or an oven or refrigerator or worry about four degree, tw minus 20 and minus 80 storage when you, when you move a house, right? But you do with a lab. I think some of our successes with this is we have well-equipped space designed for molecular. It's very challenging to be off-site completely for curbside consultations with physicians. Our turnaround time has actually improved quite a bit. So I spend about two thirds of my time at the lab and about a third of my time at the hospital facility. <clears throat> I think the big win for us has been our supply storage. We have no supplies that are stored on the floor in the testing area of the laboratory, but we use kind of a two bin Kanban system with our materials management and these get replenished every two, every two hours. Um, lab techs do not do the ordering. Our on-site materials management do that. Lab techs do not answer the phone. Lab techs function in a technical function and that is all they do in this facility. We uh, have our supply and our reagents that are stored in our materials management supermarket on-site. Uh, they handle everything from lot control to ordering and understand exactly how much we have on hand every time. And then we actually have point of use carts out in the laboratory areas and when I need a reagent or a supply, I go take it out of the, the point of use uh, cart, empty it, put it on the top and it's refilled within two hours by our materials management team who are constantly coming around resupplying us in a just in time start um, uh, type of process for our supplies. <clears throat> the other big improvement I think has been our specimen flow. 86% uh, of our specimens are delivered to a technical area within 163 feet of entering the building. So that's really a, a big improvement for us, uh, for those going to chemistry and hematology, microbiology and molecular testing. So they hit their testing areas very quickly. They don't get couriered through the hospital or through other areas and there have been some really big improvements. And this isn't just an improvement in one area, but our distance traveled really across the board has seen a 75 to 80% improvement in all of the areas of laboratory testing inside the core lab. So it's been across the board, not just in one or two areas of, of the lab. So my last few slides, I think I'll talk about the people plan, how we operationalize the lab. We really had a lot of work to do deciding what our technologists roles and responsibilities were going to be, what type of characteristics we wanted employees to have because we did not simply lift and place employees from one laboratory area in a hospital into the core lab, but everybody interviewed for the opportunity to work in this facility. Then we had a leadership structure and a training plan. <clears throat> Every leader in this facility went through a 13-week lean training process. Every technologist or anyone that works in the lab went through at least 13 days of lean training. So it was extremely challenging to staff the new lab and for them to learn the lean processes and how we wanted to operate this lab. One of the other challenges for me is I had a relatively small lab before we moved in of 13 bench level technologists and six of them were moved into laboratory administration as part of this process. So I lost about half of my experienced techs because they moved to, into other opportunities in the lab for administrators. So it was a big compliment to me that we had such a, a large number of people who moved into administration, but I think you can all empathize what it's like to lose that volume of people out of your lab with a lot of experience at, at one time. So our leadership structure uses a traditional uh, lean processing. We have teammates, we have team leads, group leads, manager and a director that report to them. So. For instance, this is my third shift operation, I believe. I have three molecular techs on third shift. So our tissue typing, HLA immunology lab, also reported to a team lead. 
three team leads report to a group lead who reports to a second or third shift director or manager who reports to the laboratory director that simply works first shift. <coughs> So as far as how we staff the molecular lab, I think traditionally molecular testing has been thought of as being a first shift operation. It had been for us for many years, although we've been a 24 seven molecular lab for several years. Um, we staff for demand. So most of the testing, most of the samples for molecular testing don't arrive during the daytime hours, right? <clears throat> so I actually have only four techs on first shift. I have five techs that work second shift when most of the testing is done and then three who work third shift. And we also staff all three shifts on Saturday and Sunday for molecular testing as well. So it's been quite a big uh, adjustment for us. I still bristle when I hear people talk about the production of a lab because I don't think any of us like to think of what we do as production, but our lean practitioners like referring to it as production. So this is how we um, handle things. From a high volume, our uh, CMV, HIV, Hep B, Hep C, viral loads, HPV testing, chlamydia and gonorrhea, MRSA and chimerism testing are performed on all three shifts, seven days a week on all three shifts. We try to do most of our very esoteric high complexity testing like esoteric viral loads to support our transplant program on first shift and most of our high volume automated testing occurs on second and third shift, but it has worked out, worked out very well. And one thing that's important when you go to this type of schedule is the idea is to complete the task that are assigned for a certain shift on that shift, not to have them roll over to the next shift. It's a very bad day when things don't go well on third shift and all of a sudden, instead of my first shift staff being able to do their assigned task, they have to not only do their assigned task, but also pick up what didn't get completed on third shift. So we try very hard uh, to make sure that we have a standard amount of work that can get easily accomplished on a particular shift. So, to wrap up, I really believe that our new facility and structure allow us to focus on four key points for success. I really think four C's that I've uh, talked about for several years <clears throat> are very important in testing for uh, molecular laboratories. One, consolidate your workflow. I think we've done this with our high volume instrumentation and moving to a core lab supporting our, our molecular facilities. Cross-train staff. I think it is impossible in a large facility to cross-train molecular staff to perform microbiology work, chemistry, hematology work, uh, cytogenetics work, but it is a very powerful thing across all the molecular disciplines of molecular genetics, molecular infectious disease and microbiology, hemologic malignancy, solid tumor oncology, and microarrays, next generation sequencing to be able to have a consolidated staff who can perform each and all of those different tests. Challenge techs. Techs do not like answering the phone in the middle of a testing process and they do not like calling and saying, where are my supplies? So by focusing on a lean uh, operation, we've taken those tests, those tasks away from laboratory staff to specialists who handle those in client services or materials management. And my techs actually like the fact that they can spend their time actually at the bench doing work now. And then controlling utilization of resources, I think is the last thing we have to do. We've really uh, improved our supply chain for, for testing supplies with this new lab. And also we have tried hard to control our utilization as to how frequently our physicians can order tests. Because if tests are, are uh, being performed in a lab and a result is not back to a physician, when they round the next time, what do they do? They order it again if the test is still not back. It doesn't matter that the test is in process. If they don't have a result, they order it again. So we've tried very hard to control our utilization by working with physician champions to limit how often they can perform tests that are clinically, to have a clinical, clinically meaningful impact. Like there's no need to perform a viral load every six hours. Every three days will work just fine. Uh, there's no need to perform a HPV test on a patient uh, every week. There's no need to perform a factor five and prothrombin uh, mutation test on a patient more than once in a lifetime, right? Unless they've had a bone marrow transplant. So I think we've had a lot of success with this and uh, appreciate the opportunity to get to share our journey in moving to a core lab and the molecular facility with you today. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, my name is Phil Ruiz, I'm at the University of Miami, and I appreciate uh, Nicholas and John's uh, presentations. They are um, 
presenting from laboratories which are very uh, much structurally different and the perspective is gonna be a, a little bit different for our lab. So if I can figure all this stuff out, I will certainly proceed. Good. And these are the learning objectives that uh, I'd like for you to consider, understanding the value of lab integration uh, vertically into a one model, uh, understanding the growing roles that molecular lab medicine has in transplantation patient management in our journey there, and understanding how lab automation of molecular-based testing is promising, but I would uh, say that it's an evolving and challenging area of monitoring transplant patients. This is the University of Miami uh, transplant programs. We're probably uh, the third largest transplant program in the, in the country. Right now, we have a very large incorporation of uh, solid organ. Let's see if I can figure the... Is there a beep? Okay, there we go. And uh, you don't want to miss the cartoon. Uh, so all these are solid organ uh, transplants that we do. I got it, thanks. And, um, and bone marrow transplant too. So very large uh, transplant program that we have. And some years ago, uh, we decided that we were going to have a laboratory that was integrated into the entire system. So basically, uh, what we asked was that the Miami Transplant Institute, which was where all the transplants are done, and then two separate hospitals, uh, Jackson Memorial Hospital and the University of Miami Hospital, would incorporate uh, with us into one vertical model. So that our lab is primarily concerned with handling transplant patients. So it's a little bit different and the reason for that was that we felt that transplant lends itself to being a service line. So we uh, has its own requirements. You have a high level uh, of multidisciplinary specialization that's needed. It requires a very large space footprint. Uh, there's a, always evolving treatment modules and we're an academic center. We are constantly changing and things that we do this year may be radically different from next. Transplant is extensively regulated, not just from the laboratory side of things, but through UNOS and a variety of things. Our lab is integrated with all of that, and it has a very high risk and with a chance for incredible success or failure. Our laboratory uh, has about 120 employees. We have about 12,000 uh, square feet, so not in the sense of the classical large laboratories uh, like you just uh, heard, but we handle all of the phases of the transplant uh, patient's journey. So for example, we handle tr pre-transplant evaluation. We know our patients from all the time they go on to dialysis or are evaluated for liver failure or, or bone marrow issues, and then through their hospital-based care and their post-transplant monitoring. And we've been doing this for 30 years, so many of our patients have passed on and we've known them uh, since the beginning of this time that they got transplants. We have very complex clinical labs, and uh, not only do we do a lot of core lab services, but some of the very high-end uh, complexity things like flow cytometry and some of the molecular tests we'll mention. Our turnaround time is one of our critical things. Why we do what we do is because our turnaround time has to be unbelievably fast, and that's one of the things that separates us from a basic hospital-based lab. So our patients have to have things very fast according to the demands of the clinical services and we try to think that we do a good job there. Our service, all of our personnel know our transplant patients inside and out. We have a very large research program. We have several uh, NIH uh, funded programs within our, our group. We have a large uh, educational process. Uh, John just mentioned the discussion and the interaction with um, your clinicians. We have this on a daily basis. This is absolutely critical for us to uh, survive. And uh, integration and participation with national agencies. A lot of the regulatory agencies are absolutely uh, critical to, for you to understand that that's how we're going to do uh, what we do. So what do we do? We evaluate donor screening and suitability. A lot of the reasons there are infectious disease, native disease, recipient suitability and screening, and recipient complications. All of these are the general categories. And our laboratory operation, as in most of you in the audience understand and are challenged with, 
is to improve our quality, reduce the opportunity for error, increase our speed of process to reduce TAT, uh, improve productivity, improve workflow, standardize processes to optimize labor, increase our capacity, cost reductions, cost avoidance, and I am sure that none of you experience this, but we are uh, having a tremendous labor shortage. So we are, how do we do more with less while improving quality and maintaining profitability? This overview shows uh, some of the areas of our lab. And again, much of the classical laboratory functions are seen in these top three categories. Then we get into high-end HLA. We have a very, very busy HLA laboratory service and that goes off into doing a, a many different esoteric things. We also have transplant pathology. So our laboratory is integrated with an anatomic pathology service that's solely dedicated to uh, handling transplant patients. And our services are provided within two hours. So whenever we get a biopsy 24 seven, these patients can have a biopsy results uh, within two hours. And we do many, many genetic studies and uh, gene analysis uh, evaluations. We have a transplant R&D lab, and obviously we have to handle all the other things. So my journey in, uh, in transplantation has been from a time um, in which uh, molecular testing really was not that big a deal. It was uh, only the esoteric test, very odd things that were done. But as all of you know, uh, they've changed tremendously. And the reason why is this, uh, amplification techniques. They increase our sensitivity, increase our identification of target, target values. They decrease our false positive test results. Uh, they're applicable to a whole variety of things, infectious disease, genetic disease, biological markers, um, better turnaround times, many uh, things. For example, in the area of microbiology, all of you understand that things are changing radically in these laboratories because of these uh, molecular techniques. We're uh, doing things much faster and more accurate. We are supplementing precision value now. All of you understand individualized medicine is here and it's going to only increase. So we are going to a point now with our patients where we're going to have precision individualized medicine that the laboratory is gonna to have to provide sub, you know, support for and that are gonna be reimbursable. We can detect multiple causative agents or abnormalities from a single clinical specimen. We can do single gene testing and find the specific ge genetic abnormality or agent. So that's why molecular medicine is taken off, uh, particularly in transplant. Um, in our laboratory now, a large proportion of molecular-based tests is now um, in, standard for us to go. So with HLA typing, we're now one of the first uh, laboratories in the country to go live with uh, next-gen sequencing. It took a year to do the validation of this. Um, some of these, when they're in the first stages, it reminds me when PCR for, first came out. It was a huge thing. I anticipate within the next year, this is gonna be uh, very, very much uh, common. But we have other ways of doing things, and these are some of the uh, molecular assays we do. Obviously, virology and immune markers. We are very uh, large on inve investing into our uh, evaluation of our biopsies and our patients as they are getting monitored in the post-transplant period. Many of our patients develop tumors, and, and we have to be ready to support them for things like this, for T, TMB antigen receptor. We have uh, disease susceptibility markers. And finally, it's not all nucleic acid. We're going to uh, another area now. Uh, we're looking at antibiotics, proteomics, metabolomics. Many of these markers are starting to have clinical application, and we're starting to look at those processes as uh, possibly being incorporated. So what about automation? With all of this, I mean, how, how do we consider automation? Um, as you know, molecular tests have historically been very labor intensive, very expensive. There was always the highly knowledgeable and expert person in the room, usually the, the manager <laughs> in the room who knew what they were doing. Um, all of you understand the human genome uh, project turned everything around. We now have methods which are faster, less complex, but they have much higher clinical utility 
because of all the new genes we've discovered. So there's things like genomics that are still evolving, but many clinical markers came out of the human genomic study, and many are amenable now to automation. Many other molecular technologies are widely different and still evolving, but the, the crux of this is that we are now starting to get to a more standardized uh, scenario and incorporate all of these things. Uh, and incorporation into the LISs and HISs is still remains an issue. So at least in the scenario that I'm describing of one lab supporting a transmit service, for me to evaluate workflow and say, do we go with an automated process or do we stick with the very uh, cumbersome labor intensive uh, manual method? So we have to look at what's the assessment of the workflow? What's the patient population being considered? We don't have thousands and thousands of specimens coming in every day. So the way we are gauging it may be uh, more suitable to a small to mid-sized laboratory that many of you may be involved with. So it's real practical issues. And what's the technological capacity of, of the different shifts? Is there a benefit for the associated costs of doing this automation? How do you define an automation? Uh, it's applicability to molecular testing. Um, the way Nicola described automation was the way I always thought of automation. You put this thing on the track, it goes in there and does its thing and you have all the support people around it. That's not the way it is uh, for us, at least in the testing that I've been able to see. There's a couple of new provocative technologies that I've seen that uh, suggest we can possibly get to that point, but I don't think we're there yet. It's certainly not walk away uh, and track fed simultaneously with the exception of a very couple of small examples. Um, so many tests remain high complexity, they're manual, laboratory developed tests, uh, gene group assays are convenient, but then they're difficult to perform individually. And why do I say that? Well, all of you have to get reimbursed for this. So we're getting to precision medicine to eventually some of these gene arrays may be somewhat difficult to say, well, if I have a 17 gene panel for a respiratory pediatric patient, is that the same panel that I should be running for an adult? Probably not because there's just some pathogens which aren't likely to be a part of that. So these are challenges which are coming. The reimbursement right now is okay, but it's going to evolve, trust me. <laughs> and FDA approved assays are the gold standard, but they're a moving target. So it's a large investment on the part of the company. It's a molecule that today is useful but we don't know what it's going to be a year from now, two years from now, so that's also a challenge. It's a challenge for the companies and for us. So I'm gonna tell you a little story about us, how we do it. We've been using manual methodology, but we decided in 2015 to try to get into an automated system, and the timetable was critical. We had personnel shortages, we are undergoing lean implementation, and I'm overwhelmed by hearing John's talk about the level of success he's had with lean. We have had a brutal time trying to implement a much smaller lab. It's, it's just been incredible, but I've learned quite a bit in the process. Uh, there was a need to, for us to expand our molecular menu using uh, IVD and LDTs in an open system. We wanted to increase our turnaround time and improve our quality. And these were some of the uh, instruments that when we first started evaluating this, and obviously there's more down. So I was thinking, well, what would we want? We would want for our transplant patients an open, flexible system, simple, general purpose, that consolidated complex workflows in an unlimited menu. I know it's kind of a pie in the sky, but you asked me what I wanted. So <laughs> quantitative and qualitative on the same instrument. Multiplex or single gene, pre-transplant and post-transplant. So in pre-transplant, for example, I have to do, let's say, NAT testing. So I have to look for some viruses. That's UNOS regulations. We have to do that. Post-transplant, I don't do that. 
I have to do other things. So it would be nice if these platforms did the same thing. Automated sample to result solution, universal extraction, multiple independent molecular analysis in the primary tube system. We have standard laboratory procedures mixed with approved assays. So in other words, we're mixing things. We have open channels, we have tracks from the company. Those are the kind of things we'd like. We'd have to be wonderfully interfaced with the LIS, and at least in our institution, that's not a given. Excellent middleware, and be able to receive the samples via a track with bi-directional capability. So if you ask me what I would want, that's what I ideally would want. I don't think there's anything out there. If you know, let me know, please. Okay, so this is more of the wish list, and it's here, not to go through all of them, but some of the points are, is it easy to set up, company support, mono reagent, things that simplify your daily work, um, reproducibility and precision, obviously we would want, stored standard curves, all these things. But again, the main thing is the ability to run different tests in one run and LDTs with FDA approved tests. So, a lot of the things we do just aren't amenable to those strict criteria that I, I put out there, but we said, okay, well, we're gonna start anyway with some of the basic things that we do and where should uh, automated molecular testing begin? And that's where I think there should be a calculable workflow, distinct patient population, a cost production benefit from an automated method versus manual. Again, our laboratory's much smaller in scope as to compare to a large reference laboratory. So we thought that infectious disease measurement was probably one because there are consistencies in how patients are requested in the transplant population, at least in the post-transplant period. Why is that? Well, recognition of infections is paramount and these patients have to be constantly monitored. These patients are also atypical in how they present clinically. We understand that these patients don't have typical findings like fever, uh, they're nonspecific and invasive testing is always extremely uh, needed because you have to make an accurate and timely diagnosis. These patients do not do well in the presence of infections. There can be donor-derived infections. This is not what many probably have to think about, but we have to do this 24-7 as donors get loaded up. We have to worry about this. Recipient-derived infections. What did these very sick patients already have on board that are going to now necessitate us having to prophylactically treat them in the post-transplant period. And then these are the post-transplant period. Are they gonna be nosocomial? Are they gonna be associated with the hospital? Or the great majority, which are community acquired. They're community acquired because they're immunosuppressed, but these are viruses that most of us in this room will not have to deal with. So some of the pathogens transmitted with solid organ transplantation are truly scary. Um, we have all these bacteria, we have parasites, viruses, fungi. All of these are capable of being transmitted through the donor. And just yesterday we went live with a dengue and Zika PCR assay that we had to work on big time because we're in Miami. So now we have 10 cases in Dade County and we have two donors which are already positive. You know, those are the kind of things I'm, with transplant that always are evolving. We don't know what these viruses are gonna do in these patients in the post-transplant period, but I can't imagine that they're positive things. So a variety of serological assays and PCR-based assays and other things are done to evaluate these patients. All of this is done within 10 hours. So the patient gets identified. The donor, prospective donor, so we're, the HLA lab is doing one thing and the other lab is doing all these things at the same time. So it's a huge mission to try to get one of these patients to donate, but potentially you could have five people getting solid organ transplants. Two kidneys, pancreas, liver, 
So the whole thing is extremely important. You can't afford to make mistakes. Well, that's in the donors and the recipients. Well, what about in the, in the post-transplant period? Well, we understand that we can't just measure the bugs. We have to be able to understand the host. What are the defense mechanisms? Can we monitor the immune system in these patients? This is something that uh, I've been interested in for some time. And we're now getting to these assays where, at least from an immune-based point of view, we can monitor adaptive and innate immune uh, defense mechanisms that we think are predictors of what these patients may have and therefore imply that we should have certain prophylactic regimens with these patients. Then we have to worry about what are the bugs. We just mentioned Zika, there's other things that people are now getting exposed to. I mean, it's a whole balance of things that you have to consider in the post-transplant period. So let's talk about viral monitoring. And it's a growing family, unfortunately. And depending where the transplants are done, some of these viruses are a little more prevalent than others. Um, as I mentioned, we now have uh, some of these, I think the battery does, there we go. It's just like me, I guess I'm almost out. Here we go, okay. Anyway, all these viruses should be considered do we have to really worry about them on a two-hour basis sometimes? Uh, probably not, but I think that if you go beyond one day or two days on monitoring any of these viruses, you're taking tremendous chances. By the way, this is from not just fluids, but from tissue. This has to be from biopsies that you take from these patients. You have to validate assays in which you do uh, formalin uh, paraffin-embedded tissue and look at these viruses there. So my last several slides are gonna be, how are we starting to do this? We're probably way behind the curve on a lot of large uh, processes using automation, but this is how we were doing it. So what we did was we said, well, let's take CMV and just see if we can improve things, okay? And, and we are using a current method with an Abbott M2000, it's very manual, ABI 7500, real-time PCR, and we were using Elitech and then Roche reagents uh, for the other part of it. So we got some patient samples and positive or negative, and we stored these samples uh, at 80 degrees, uh, eight, minus 80, and um, then did the study. So we did a total of 20 negative and 32 positives, and then they were run uh, concurrently with our current manually, manual method and the automated method. And we did LOD, LOQ, linearity studies for these. Positivity and negativity of the samples were compared. Outstanding comparison. Obviously, the automated technique was very good. And the quantitative comparison uh, was extremely good. So we have very good uh, findings between the automated method and our uh, very labor-intensive manual method. Our precision was very strong within run and run-to-run -run correlation over a period of five days. And we did this for uh, two other viruses which are very commonly monitored in these patients, EBV and BK. So if you look at product process flow comparison, and this is value-added versus non-value-added, in the current manual process, we had value-added time of 27%. When we measured this by automation, okay, it went up to 96%. So just that, non-value time was significantly changed when we had our automated method uh, put in there. So automation reduced the non-value-added and waste activities and this reduced turnaround time and opportunity for errors. If you add time to result on top of that, now look, and it's even more impressive, you now have a total time of 169 minutes for these uh, assays versus the current method of 359 minutes. So that for sure in product process flow comparison, we had a 
53% reduction in our turnaround time. How about the operator? So our daily process operator analysis showed value added versus non-value added. And in the current process, we had 11% with the value added time, and it increased to 26%. So here, operator analysis evaluates the technologist's activities while performing the testing. We found that there was a reduction in the non-value added activities, reduced technologist time spent performing the testing, hands-on time, reduced TAT, and reduces the opportunity for errors. So it also improved us to actually walk away from the system. So for us, this was a big, big positive. And if you look at the value added versus non-value added for the operator, total time, 23 minutes. With the value added of there versus 67 minutes for the operator. So the technologist's time spent performing testing and hands-on time was reduced by 72%, less than two minutes per sample. Again, we had a very manual method. For, so for us, this was truly eye-opening and has led us into this next era that we're going into, which is to try to automate as much as possible, but with all the criteria we asked before. And the complexity. We now have a testing menu that is not high complexity. This is a big deal. We talked about the challenges with our personnel, putting them on three shifts 24-7. We're not gonna have the same competency of individuals 24-7, which we have. So this allows us to use less experienced technologists to perform testing and use the system on multiple shifts. It improves the quality by diminishing the opportunity for contamination and errors. So my last slide is this. Yes, there's some benefits. There's a reduction in the non-standard processes, reduced variation, optimization of turnaround time by standardizing or eliminating time while reagents and samples wait between the process steps. The reagents and samples are transported about the lab and the variation in skill and, tech use, and technique used by very different technicians. It increased the quality by eliminating multiple manual steps. It improved the precision of results, reduced the number of repeats, reduced the number of potential errors, reduces the potential for contamination. It increased the operations flexibility and reduces costs. It allows us to use less experienced technologists to perform ASR testing, reducing repeats, and we're able to store standard curves. So in summary, I think that at least our journey in a different scenario, granted, but showing how we can now get from the balance of a manual system to being able to now try to get an automated system going, but still not lose that flavor of having to be able to respond quickly whenever these new pathogens come up. So I'm very optimistic uh, with a lot of the new uh, machinery that's coming out that we're going to be able to incorporate that. But until then, hang on, because it's going to be fun. <laughs> Thank you. OK, we'll begin our Q&A portion. Thank you so much, Dr. Longshore and Dr. Ruiz, for very, really very excellent and enlightening presentations. Um, at this time, are there any questions from the audience? Yes. I have a question for John. Yes. How did you So yeah, for those of you that didn't hear the question, I think I think the crux of the question is uh, this: our lab design process took a significant amount of time and effort, 
and how did we get buy-in from our administrators to <coughs> devote such time and effort to the design process? Is that, yes. okay. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I will have to say that our hospital system has invested very heavily in um, lean. Um, as I said, my laboratory is 28,000 square feet. The other half of the building is our performance excellence lean center for the hospital system. And we all report up to the same senior vice president. So uh, it was actually his idea that this is how our laboratory would be designed because he is also over uh, radiology and pharmacy and they had gone through very similar design processes in pharmacy prior to us using the same design methodology uh, with the 3P events for the laboratory. So uh, believe it or not, we did not have to sell this to someone, but someone had to sell it to us. Uh, I'll, I'll be, be happy to go first. The question is, is how, uh, how important is middleware and interfacing from an IT perspective for all of our molecular equipment? How does that impact the lab? One of the big problems we have in, in molecular laboratory testing is even our high volume automated instruments, many of them are sample uh, in, result out, but then at the end you have to take that result and manually enter it into the electronic medical record. So, we are, uh, have about 50% of my molecular testing now is automated without middleware, but we are in the process of implementing a middleware solution so that all of our molecular testing uh, will go through a middleware interface to be reported into our LIS. Because it doesn't matter how great your test is, if you have to manually enter a result, there's a great opportunity for, uh, for error. And, uh, uh, the, the errors in the type of testing that we do and the, the type of testing that, that, that Phil does and, and all of our labs uh, can be catastrophic. So I think we uh, need to rely more on middleware and molecular testing as we have in chemistry, hematology, and other areas that uh, have high volume automation for many years. Dr. Rose. Yeah, I mean, ex excellent points, and I think we have had to do workarounds for so many years. Uh, all you need to do is, as John said, get burned on one or two, and you quickly realize you need two people. I, I treat everything as if we're putting an ABO result into there. That's If you treat everything like that with all of the criteria, then if you have to unfortunately do manual entry, then you at least have two people and all of this validation and all the things we try to do. The reality is, though, that a lot of the middleware that's coming, uh, we're now in the process of interfacing many of our instruments that and redoing our interfaces. Um, some of the middleware, they sit down with you and they say, well, what do you want? Do you want to review the curves? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? It's very customizable, and I think that's where I'm excited about that part. Uh, and I'm assuming that when I press go after we release all these results, that hopefully they're going to be in, you know, into the uh, EMR uh, without any uh, touching on the basis of, of the, I don't know if that addresses your question. Is there a generic middleware? No. Well, I mean, I don't wanna talk about companies, but there's one big company that does a lot of outstanding interfaces with, comp with instruments. All of you know it. Uh, but they are allowing in middleware solutions that they themselves have and that others may have. And, um, you know, I do HLA as well, for example, and we have uh, very specific histo track and all these other things that were very specific to that. The main thing to me is, is as we just explained, you want hands off and you want ease, but you want a buffer where somebody can review the results, it's documented they reviewed it, then if you want a second person to review it, they should document that, and then they're released. And we have to, a lot of times, do that remotely in the middle of the night or letting results go. Other questions from the audience? 
how yes. Do, how do people handle um, specimen types? So if you're putting it on the um, brochure per bus 4800 or something, so you might have a urine, you might have a swab, and we need to say what the swab is. Um, do, does anyone have any great ideas of automating that like in chemistry? Or you might put a suffix on it to say it's a glucose tube rather than a, a serum. Well, do you have any good ideas to share with us? <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the uh, exciting features for some of the emerging instruments that are just coming to the clinical market for molecular testing is we're getting away from a batch mentality. Uh, we're getting we're getting to a continuous flow. Some of the instruments can even be put on an automation line to be belt fed uh, for some of the higher volume molecular tests. And when we can do that and have them interfaced on the back end to the EMR, so they become uh, much more uh, automatable, much more uh, third shift friendly, and uh, also maybe even a uh, moderate or waived complexity type of environment, I think, I think happens. Now, on the other end of the perspective, we're also seeing uh, the emergence of molecular testing into the point of care environment. So uh, I think uh, the, the middle is kind of going away. We're going to high volume automated and we're going to point of care. And it's gonna be very interesting to see how the field evolves with that over the next few years. Yeah, I, I mean, speaking about if I get a nasal swab in one tube and then it's coming down and I have a, a serum on the same patient, who's separating these and are we going to have an intelligent enough system that's going to know that? Yeah. Obviously not, not at this point, but um, again, with massive volumes, I, I can't imagine that that technology will not eventually develop, but you do need to have still some individuals who can say, this is this and this is this because it's going to be coming down eventually getting the DNA or RNA, whatever you're going to do, but there are going to be some differences. And that's going to be extremely complex uh, automated software and uh, capabilities to see those different type of things as far as I'm concerned, but I can't, I can imagine it's coming. Not here though. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. We can take one more question. Again, that's why I put that up there, and I, I guess it'll be shared for the, that's a wish list, and I'm, so, I'm, a, I'm still a scientist at heart, and so I'm always asking for what's impossible in these instruments, and, and you talk to some companies, they say, well, we got an open channel, and I say, well, I want this too, I want this too, and those are the kind of limitations that eventually you have to work around and do. Um, I would say that the main thing right now is workflow. That's my biggest challenge. I don't know how it's going to incorporate. If I had tremendous numbers of samples coming in and of a certain pathogen, it's a no-brainer. You go with that. But when you go with, wow, I have one parvo a day, and how do I work that in? It's the same molecular assay. You want that instrument to be able to be able to adjust to that like that. that that's the limitation right now that, that I would see. Um, I think LIS, I thought that was an outstanding question, is still tremendously limiting. Um, but uh, those are the things off the top of my head. I, all the positive things that I was listing, that really, because the manual's not the panacea. <laughs> the manual is horrible. Uh, as far as a lot of those features. So you take what you can get. Okay. 
if I, I, oh, go ahead. I've, I've got a couple of things for the wish list if we're asking. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, two, two items that we really are limited on our high volume automated instruments and molecular testing right now is the, the concept of, you know, a stockyard or archiving the samples because we often get uh, add on tests the following day. And we don't have the type of uh, stockyarding or sample archiving capabilities like we do on chemistry and hematology lines. Uh, the other thing that, that, that I've been asking for for a few years is, is a uh, variable viral load detection. We know what a viral load, when it is performed on label, looks like from a milliliter of plasma or half a milliliter of plasma, but we don't always get the amount of sample that we request. We get short draws often. It would be nice if we had a molecular instrument sometime that could sense the amount of input material that you had available and vary the limit of detection and limit of quantification based upon the input volume rather than always having to have a fixed volume. We're years away from that, but I think, I think we'll eventually get there. Excellent. I'd like to again thank our speakers for really excellent presentations and discussion.